So we're recording live. Now, I do have a setup today. Let's make sure that, yes, that's going to work. So I do have a setup today with a document camera that we can also display, and that way it all gets recorded. Say that. Oh, let's zoom out. There we go. Okay. Technology. It's great when it works. <clears throat> All right. I want to clarify. I think I misspoke last time. Um, that happens sometimes. Let's clarify now, though. So, last time we spent a good amount of time talking about working our way into the process of cell division. Right, well, uh, and the whole cycle that which through which a cell is going to go in order to undergo cell division. <clears throat> One of the most important things that has to occur <clears throat> is the DNA has to be copied. So the DNA stores, as we've discussed before, the DNA stores information needed to build proteins. We've got all these proteins throughout the cell carrying on all these processes, all these enzymes, all these structural proteins. And the cell needs good information on how to build those. The DNA contains them. And we talked about the structure, and so I just kind of wrote it up into a little statement here. The DNA wraps around the histones, and the histones are connected to the nucleosomes. And you can sing a little song if you like, right? Um, and then the nucleosomes are wound up, and they form the substance we call chromatin. Now, typically, the chromosomes don't, within the cell, they don't normally form this bound chromosome structure we see. Most of the time, the DNA is, is somewhat uncoiled, spread out, contained within the nucleus of the cell in this chromatin form, and that way it's easier for the mechanisms of the cell to access the DNA, get the information off the DNA, uh, create RNA copies, mRNA copies to go out in the cell, and, and the ribosomes produce proteins from them. When it's all tightly bound up into a, a nice chromosome package, it's hard for the cells to, to get the information it needs off the DNA. So normally the DNA is not in this chromosome, this X shape that you see there, package that we normally think about chromosomes. Okay? But the entire strand, we talked about, you know, if you take all of the DNA in a human cell and stretch it out, it's, it's really long, right? About two meters, about six feet or so. Um, and it's all gonna get packed down and then for the cell to divide, two copies of that has to be in the cell, right? Because it needs two, each cell is gonna need, excuse me, its own copy of that. Now, so those are some common terms. We talked about those last time. Here's where I misspoke last time. I'm gonna clear this right up. Um, I was trying to figure out where does this term chromatid uh, show up? Well, let's, let's figure this out. Chromosome, confusingly, can refer to two things. It could be a single strand of DNA condensed down into chromatin and then condensed down into a manageable piece. That can be a chromosome, one single strand, one single copy of the genetic information within the cell. We also refer to when that chromosome has been replicated it forms this X shape. That's because there's two copies. Right? So it forms two copies. You have one copy, and you have the other copy, and they're joined by this thing called Centromere. The chromatids, which I'm going to draw this on the document cam here. So the chromatids refer to, again, if you've got This is what we would typically call a chromosome. And when that gets replicated in the S phase of interphase, there's now two copies of that ready to go one to each of the two new cells. 
This is also called a chromosome. And I've got the two of them together. That's called a chromosome, which I, I don't know. <laughs> I looked at that, I'm like, why in the world wouldn't you call that something different? They're joined by this structure called the centromere. Each of these, these replicated copies, when they're together like this, these are called chromatids. The entire structure is called a chromosome. The entire X-shaped structure that, that carries two copies. That is called the chromosome. That's classically kind of how we think about the chromosome being shaped, is this X-shaped structure. That's actually two copies, and this is when we can see the chromosome, is when the cell is getting ready to divide, the chromatin is condensed into chromosomes, and a lot of times we can see the two of them lined up, ready to be separated. We call this structure the chromosome as well as if we're just dealing with one copy of it. We call that the chromosome. But when there's two of them bound together, we call the whole thing a chromosome. And we call the individual pieces, the individual copies, they get this fancy name, the chromatid. Once they separate, they're now both chromosomes. Which I, I, don't know, I, I went through about four videos last night. You should ask my wife how, it's like, you gotta be kidding me. Why in the world wouldn't you? No, it, it, yeah, it's, uh, and finally, I remember watching, because uh, your textbook pointed to a Khan Academy video. Um, if you've, if you're, I don't know, how many, how many of you ever watched Khan Academy? Like some Khan Academy? I like Sal, he's, he's pretty good. Uh, I like what he does. Um, and he was actually, he did a, a video, about two or three videos talking about the mitosis process. And they're kind of long and lengthy. You might watch them at double speed, but um, I, I think you might find them helpful. I know he went through a video about I don't know, about three or four minutes into it, he talks about this. I was like, all right, since he's explained it, that kind of makes more sense. When I've read it, when I've looked at it, I'm like, that. why would I call them chromatids? But then they're chromosomes, and now they're chromosomes. They're not chromosomes here, they're chromatids. Does that make sense? That help a little bit? When you got the two copies together, and they are together, joined by a centromere, that, that structure is a, is a chromosome. When you just have one copy, that's a chromosome. When the two are together, the individual copies are called chromatids. Once they separate, they're now called chromosomes. Okay? Hopefully that helps. Like I said, I know I, I wrestled with that a good amount last night. Okay? Uh, I put this website in here. I, I found this. It's kind of, I don't know how reputable I would call a, a website called BioNinja, but, you know, hey, I'm, I'm giving credit for what they did here. I thought this was pretty cool. I wish they'd give source of where they got their information, but I thought, hey, that's kind of cool. They've got, they've actually got an electron, electron scanning microscope of an actual chromosome they take. So I thought that was kind of cool. So anyway, I, that, the diagram that I borrowed there and put in our slides is, is here on this website. Um, again, it looks like they've got pretty good information. I didn't dig in here real deep, but just understand that's just a random site on the internet. So. <laughs> It is what it is, but I read through this. I'm like, all right, I don't mind citing this. Everything there's tracks, everything there is, is correct. So, uh, and, and that's a cool picture. Anyway, all right, <clears throat> let's see here. Should be able to go back to presentation. There we are. So again, the, the X shape, the classic X shape, that is a chromosome, but it's, two joined copies. So I grabbed this slide from last time. That's where I said, well, it's not technically incorrect to say when chromosomes are duplicated in chromatids form, but it's not the best way to, to describe this. It describes what we just talked about here. So when you have two copies together, each individual copy is called a chromatid. The entire copy structure of the two copies together is called a chromosome. That occurs during the S phase. So we talked about this last time. Talk about what we call interphase, which occurs before the cell divides, and that's when the cell is getting ready to divide. It's going to store up all this energy, it's going to store up all the components, all the molecules that it needs to build up, all the DNA, all the enzymes it's going to need to do the division. Is that in the gap one phase, the G1 phase? And 
S phase is where we actually duplicate all of the DNA. We need two copies, one for each cell. And the, the, the DNA actually condenses into these chromosome structures. <clears throat> and then the G2 phase, the second gap, is where we go ahead and we just expended all this energy to copy the DNA. Now we need some more energy to get ready to, to move all the DNA, separate it, get everything done correctly, and make copies. Okay, so review. We looked at this last time. We said the, the process of mitosis, the actual where the cell basically divides up everything by half, you can see is a very small sliver in most cells' lifespan. A lot of time is spent getting to that point. That's what we call the interface. G1, S, G2. And if we looked at all this last time, I got the review stamp on this, this slide here. Um, and we can, let's talk a little more about mitosis today. That's going to be our focus today is mitosis. Uh, just briefly about cytokinesis and then uh, finish out chapter 10 where we talk a little bit about how do we know when we're ready and, and what happens when things go wrong. So again, if we look at mitosis here, this little sliver of that entire pie chart, and we're going to go through each one of these, right? So you don't have to, you don't just copy anything down, just copy down the names of those. Uh, protophase, prometaphase, or prophase, prometaphase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. You can copy those down right now. Found this cool graphic on the internet. I was looking for something else, and this one popped up. I was like, all right, that's... That's even better. I'm going to throw that one in there. Okay. <clears throat> so again, we'll, we're going to talk about these. We'll probably come back and watch this graphic again after we've talked about these. I think I'm going to draw this with you as we go. All right. So um, that's part of the reason I wanted to have the document camera today is to talk with you as we go here. So <clears throat> let's look at this. Um, let's look at each one of these. So I've kind of cut these apart and blown them up. All right, well, let's just see if I can manage my windows here. Okay. So if we talk about prophase here, go away. Grab the wrong window. We talk about prophase here. <clears throat> so let's talk about, that's probably really loud on the video. Let's talk about mitosis. <clears throat> The phases of mitosis, the first one, of course, is the prophase. We say prophase is where the chromosomes condense. You can actually begin to see the X structures. You've got these, um, these, these structures out here called the centromeres. So I'm not gonna draw all the chromosomes. I'm just gonna draw roughly kind of a nucleus in here. And we're gonna draw maybe one, maybe two chromosomes in here. You guys can't see what I'm drawing, can you? So maybe we'll draw two chromosomes in here. So the chromosomes begin to form in the prophase. <clears throat> now you have these structures out here We're going to talk about these in a second, these centrioles out here. All right, so again, prophase, just kind of a simple drawing there. Chromosomes condense, become visible. We start to see some fibers begin to show up both on the centromeres in the chromosomes as well as these structures out here where the, what we call the meiotic spindle is going to begin to form. The nuclear envelope is going to begin to break down, right? So the nuclear envelope is going to begin to break down just a bit. So gaps will start to form in it as, it, as the cell starts taking it apart so we can move chromosomes around and out of it here, okay? All right, so the next phase and so feel free to write notes on your drawings as you're drawing along here, but I'm trying to draw with you so I kind of gauge how fast I should go and, and kind of get a little better feel for what, what's kind of critical here. All 
as I was in my head trying to think about, all right, what's the best way to conduct this lecture? I thought, well, I probably should draw some of this with you, all right? So the prometaphase, <clears throat> again, the chromosomes continue to become tightly bound up, wound up, form into little X's here. <clears throat> and you have these structures, and, and I'm going to butcher some of their names. Um, <clears throat> The, the kinetic chore, the kinetic ores, and again, the, the mitotic spindle begins to extend microtubules that will attach, basically, it's, it's basically the mechanisms that are going to show up in place that are going to begin to separate the chromosomes, right? So again, one copy on each. The goal is to have two separate cells with one chrome, exact same sets of chromosomes in each cell. So you have these structures out here, these meiotic spindles, and they began to form these little microtubules that will attach to each of the chromosomes. And they move out here to the edge of opposite ends of the cells. And the microtubules are these structures that emit from this, this spindle structure. And they come over here and they attach to this kinetochores. We should look up the pronunciation of that. Don't take my word for it. These emit from the chromosomes from the centromeres themselves, right? So you've got these, if I go back up to our chromosome up here, you've got this, this term here that I'm not sure how, how we should pronounce it. All right, they extend off of the centromere and they attach then to the microtubules that come off of these centrioles out here in the cell. <clears throat> this is prometaphase. Metaphase, which I've just drawn this almost the exact same thing. Um, metaphase is where these chromosomes are perfectly lined up in the center of the part, center of the part, <laughs> the center of the cell. All right, the meiotic spin, mitotic spindle is fully developed. Centromeres are at, or the centrosomes are at the opposite poles of the cell. Chromosomes are lined up perfectly. There's basically kind of this imaginary line that you can draw in here that we would call the metaphase plate. And it's not an actual plate that forms in the cell. It's just this imaginary plane, imaginary line that we could draw and say that those, those chromosomes line up. Well, they all, basically, they all line up to be divided apart. They all get nice and organized. And the cell needs to make sure each new cell has the correct chromosomes. So we will not proceed until this step is perfectly completed. <clears throat> These mitotic spindles, they also attach to the cell wall. And I guess the plasma membrane, so they can pull these chromosomes quickly to the other ends of the cells. And again, and I'm just drawing two chromosomes here. There's more in most species. Humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes that this occurs for. Uh, so 46 chromosomes are going to get split up in a human cell whenever it divides. So metaphase is right before we take the chromosomes apart. Anaphase, 
is where the chromosomes, the centromere gets dissolved, essentially, if you will. Hang on a second. So anaphase, everything's still inside one cell. That comes later. We'll divide the, this, um, the, the plasma membrane up a little bit later. But the anaphase is where we actually separate the chromosomes. Right? We separate the copies in the chromosomes. So now I've got, let me zoom back just a bit. So now I've got the chromatids that were in to get joined together at the centromere in the metaphase. They've now separated. These spindles, these microtubules are pulling those apart. And now they're, since they're separated, we no longer call them chromatids, we call them now chromosomes. So the sister chromatids are now separated because we've dissolved the proteins that bind them together in the centromere. <clears throat> and the cell gets, continues to elongate just a little bit, so it's easier to cleave it in two. And then we have what we call telophase, which is kind of the last phase in mitosis. That's where things start moving around. So it's still in one cell, but basically I kind of have now two separate cells. The spindle, the microtubules begin to retract back into the spindle. A nuclear envelope begins to form around the remaining chromosomes. And they begin to kind of decompress. They begin to uh, form back out into a chromatin. And you have that on both ends. Your other organelles migrate to each end of the cell, they're called holes. So basically, again, you got kind of like two cells, two functional cells within one roof, so to speak, kind of one within one plasma membrane. And then you're ready for what we call cytokinesis. That's where the cells actually divide up. So now I've got two complete daughter cells ready to be split up. Cytokinesis is where you actually physically split the two. Uh, your text talks about the idea of um, in animal cells, we have what we call the cleavage furrow um, begins to build. In plant cells, because you have the cell wall, and which is very a rigid, very rigid structure, whereas with most other cells, that plasma membrane is pretty soft and, and somewhat squishy, if you will. It can be manipulated. Um, when you get in plants, it, it's crunchy, I guess. I mean, think about lettuce. <laughs> those, those structures are pretty crunchy. Um, so you can't just squeeze, basically, uh, the plasma membrane of, of a plant cell to, to squish it into two parts. With a, with a plant cell, they actually have to build the structure in between the two cells. They'll build, they'll begin to build, the, the Golgi apparatus will begin to build kind of this temporary structure called the cell plate. And then the cell will begin building um, additional structure onto that and actually build a cell wall between the two cells. Uh, and then the, the remains of the Golgi apparatus will kind of coalesce into um, their, um, the membranes of the Golgi apparatus there will, will form into what becomes the rest of the plasma membrane on either side of that cell wall. 
found uh, a couple of cool pictures on the internet. Um, there's a link here. There's some really cool biological, there's like 20 awesome biological microscopic pictures. Go, go check that out. <laughs> it's, it, that's pretty cool. This they said was actually a cancerous cells dividing, um, but still going through the cytokinesis process. You have two copies, divide them up. Um, I just pulled the, the graphic there out of your book, kind of explaining how with plant cells you've got, again, after after the chromosomes have been split, then we got to build this, we've got to build a rigid wall between the two cells. Well, how do you do that? Well, you start with kind of a temporary structure and then you build on top of that. So, let's see, what have I got here? I thought I would go, I meant to duplicate this slide after all that, come back and we, we look at this again, just say, well, Again, think about kind of how this works. You've got these two structures on the outskirts of the cell that move around and they come in, they grab the, the chromosomes. As we move through the process, we line those chromosomes up, we pull them apart, pull the chromatids apart. Now we've got two copies of the chromosomes on each side. The spindle can retract, the cells can reform on either side of the, what we call the poles of the cell. Now there's two size of the cell now, they're identical, and then we can split. Uh, they say in animal cells, a, a ring of proteins, and similar occurs with bacteria, you have this ring of proteins forms right at the, um, where it pinches the two uh, cells apart. A, a ring of proteins forms there and, and actually begins to contract, and it continues to contract until the plasma membranes come so close together they'll fuse in two separate cells literally uh, furrows it off, it pinches it off, so to speak. <clears throat> Questions here? Important process. I thought we, that's the reason I feel like I'm going to draw this with you. Um, <clears throat> don't have to, don't necessarily have, you want to know the steps, you want to know the order of the steps and have a rough idea if you do nothing else, know what's occurring with the chromosomes at each step. Okay, no one's, that's kind of the most critical. I mean, it's, it's important that each of the, the two new cells gets all of the proper organelles and all the other components they need. But none of that matters if we mess up the copies of the chromosomes. We've got to make sure each cell gets the right copies of the right chromosomes um, at each, each point. And it's, it's a very elaborate process. So again, know the order of the steps and know roughly what's going on with the chromosomes at each of the steps. And that's, that's really kind of the, the critical stuff that I'm really going to be looking for there. Okay, so cytokinesis, we talked about that. Okay. So a nice thought question. If what happens if you know, as you see, there's multiple steps in this mitosis process. What happens if uh, cells are just allowed to do that uncontrolled? What do you think happens? Tumor. Tumor. Yes. What else? What's that? Mutation. Can. Absolutely can. Mutations can occur. Isn't that basically what a tumor is? It just grows and grows and grows and just it yes. off? Yes. So what, what, is, what is bad about a tumor? What does a tumor do for us that's bad? The tumor is a good example of this. What does a tumor do that's bad for us? It's space that it shouldn't be in. Yep. All right. And what does it do to the cells around it? Yeah, it's hungry. They are, those cells are now allowed to uncontrollably reproduce. They need all the resources they can find to do that. They'll get those resources anywhere they can find them, whatever means they can, whatever, whatever means they can harness to get them. And that's the reason that's, that's important, right? So we have the section in the text we talk, after we talk about this process of, you know, we talk about the importance of this process. We talk about, all right, how do we, how do we make sure it's done right? How do we make sure it's done correctly, right? Um, and, and you guys have kind of hit on this already a little bit. What happens if 
you have a damaged cell and that damaged cell is allowed to reproduce. And that's one example of that is well, that's how cancer begins, right? Is you've got a cell that for whatever reason, <laughs> and again, remember, DNA is in a human cell is two meters long, okay? There's a lot of letters in the alphabet. I mean, there's only four letters in the alphabet of DNA, A, T, C, and G. And all it takes is one or two of those letters along a two meter length of molecules to be out of place. That's what we call a mutation. And it only takes one of those to be out of place during this whole process where the whole thing gets copied and split up for bad things to happen. So it's really important that we've got mechanisms that watch how this occurs. Um, one of the reasons we can't, we, that we struggle to come up with a flu vaccine is because the flu virus doesn't have a good way of controlling the process of its DNA replication. So it's constantly mutating, always mutating. There's always new variants of, of, a, of a virus that doesn't really have good control on its ability to reproduce. Right. We're finding with COVID that it, it is producing more variants than we were hoping. It's not like polio where it's really well controlled. Um, it's not like smallpox, but you know, it's, at least it's slower than the flu and it's slow enough that we're, it appears that we're gonna be able to get out in front of it. Um, your text talks about three main checkpoints in the cell. I'm gonna leave it to you on your own time to to make sure you're aware of what are these checkpoints, okay? What are these checkpoints of control in the cell and what do they do? Um, <clears throat> but you know, really what they're gonna do is, is they're gonna make sure the main things that they're gonna look for, they're gonna look for is there damage to the DNA? Was the DNA damaged? If the DNA is damaged in any way, if it detects some kind of damage to the DNA, we're gonna make sure that that, if at all possible, we're gonna fix it. If not, we're gonna initiate self-destruction. We're gonna initiate apoptosis and destroy the cell. And that way, again, what happens if damaged cells are allowed to reproduce? They reproduce more damaged cells, right? <clears throat> so you've got these various points where, so after the DNA, remember S phase is where the DNA is, is duplicated. So we've got to check and make sure, were, was there any problems with that duplication? Was, was there anything wrong with that? Uh, and then we've got this checkpoint where we say, all right, well, our, again, we, we talked about in, um, you know, in, in metaphase and anaphase where the cell, the chromosomes are getting pulled off and this half gets one chromosome and this half gets an exact copy of the same chromosome. We have to make sure at this checkpoint, hey, are, it, are all of the chromosomes attached and ready to be separated? Because if they're not, if those chrom if one chromatid's not attached, that cell's not going to get that copy and it's going to be damaged. <clears throat> two flavors, what I would call two flavors of regulation. There's what we call positive regulation. Positive regulation is where um, the positive regulation allows the cell to move through to the next phase in the cycle. That's pretty simple. Negative, negative regulation holds the cell back, prevents it from moving forward. Okay. Um, and again, damaged DNA is one of the common things that, that we're really looking for. So that's really critical. But I mentioned also it is during metaphase, we're going to check and make sure all the all the chromosomes attached to the mitotic spindle. <clears throat> so your text talks about a, a couple of these, uh, a couple of mechanisms the cell is going to use to regulate. One of those is this um, retinoblastoma protein. There's two of them that it refers to, P53 and P21. The P re re refers to, or the P53 refers to the atomic weight of those uh, compounds. It says it's 53, your text says it's 53 Daltons and 21 Daltons. 
what that means is that um, it refers to how many molecules have to be present for a mole of that substance. Those who have, are going through chemistry right now. Again, it refers to the molecular weight of those substances. If that doesn't mean anything to you, that's okay. Chemistry is not a requirement for this course, but it's nice to take those two together. I think some of you guys are finding that. Okay. So <clears throat> this RB, we refer to it RB for short, RB53 and RB21. So what they will do is they can bind up with the um, with the, the enzymes that begin the process of copying the DNA, right? opening the DNA and allowing it to be copied. The RB53, if, if, if damage is detected to the DNA, the RB53 can bind to the enzymes that would normally begin the process of copying DNA and prevent it from doing that. And then and as the RB53 levels will increase, the RB21 levels will also increase. And it has, it employs, I forget what mechanism it employs, but it employs another mechanism that also prevents the cell from progressing forward. So basically, it's, this is negative regulation. We talked about positive and negative regulation. The RB53 and the RB21, they're checking to make sure the DNA is good before we move forward to the mitosis phase. Well, actually, before we, you know, we move past S phase and move into mitosis in the G2. Um, they're employing a negative regulation that stops or halts the progression of the process. And the, as best we can tell, the way they do that is they bind up to, again, the enzymes that allow the DNA copying to occur. Um, now, what we, and, and part of the reason we know so much or understand so much about these two proteins is because most cancer cells or cancer tumors that we analyze, we find damage to the proteins, these proteins, right? They're damaged somehow. They don't function properly. These are called tumor suppressor proteins because they control, they prevent uncontrolled reproduction of cells. Okay. Now, so imagine if that RB53 is the protein that, that prevents damaged DNA from being passed on to the next cell. And if it's not doing its job. So now you start producing cells that have damaged DNA. They have some various problems. And because they have less ability to regulate themselves, they will, mutations occur all the time. Again, DNA is this really long structure, lots of places for changes to occur accidentally, and they do. A little bit of a couple of radiation, high energy radiation particles strike that DNA structure. Um, it can scramble a few things up. And when that's detected, RB53 comes in and says, stop what you're doing, what's this is. But if RB53 can't do that, now I've, <laughs> again, so the, the first generation of daughter cells, they're damaged, and they have less ability to catch and repair damage that occurs to them in their life cycle. So now there's a better chance that they're going to have even more of that, that generation of damaged cells is going to have more damage, right? So uh, let's say one mutation. So RB53 gets damaged, RBP53 gets damaged. So that produces two cells. So they already have one mutation on board. There's one damage in their DNA and they have less ability to repair their own DNA. So there's a good chance now they might, this one might have two mutations. It might pick up another mutation before it divides. And this one over here might pick up five. Because again, the ability to control that DNA, to recognize the DNA has been damaged and fix it, has been damaged. So now this one might have a handful of mutations. This one might have more. Now this one's going to produce cells with even more. I'm oversimplifying here. You know, maybe this mutation really doesn't cause as much damage. Maybe these kind of stay at two. 
But as you pick up, as you once you damage this thing, you increase the ability to pick up more mutation damage as you progress forward because these cells are now less effective at repairing their own DNA. So every generation after them is potentially even worse at repairing its own DNA. And they hit a point where they just grow uncontrollably. They can. Once they hit that point where they grow uncontrollably, that's, again, as we talked about, that's kind of the whole idea of cancer, of how that occurs. And once they begin growing uncontrollably, they'll start consuming whatever resources they can find by whatever means necessary because they need to continue to multiply. That's what they're now doing. And so that's why this is so critical and why this is so important. Again, RBP53 and RBP21, how do we know so much about these? Why, why, why these two proteins? Well, again, every cancerous tumor that we study typically has damage on one or both of these proteins, or at least the way they're constructed. So the DNA that constructs these specific proteins is damaged, and the whole ability for that cell to catch its own mistakes is further damaged just about every time it, it multiplies, or at least potentially is. Okay. All right. Questions there? Does that make sense? So far, so good? Okay. So a couple of terms we, I pulled out of the, the section where we talk about, because it, it, in the chapter, we, we talk an entire section, I think it's 10-4, talks, uh, talks about cancer. Um, I'm, I'm not going through all the detail in there. There's some good detail in there. Go through it, watch the videos, look at the animation sites. If you haven't already figured out, those are, those are really good ways of, of, I think I've talked before about tricking your brain into thinking this, this stuff's important. Hold on to it. Don't dump it out with, with all the Facebook posts you scroll through or whatever you look at, right? Expose yourself to this information multiple times, not just what I tell you and not just what you read in the book. You guys now have all this I mentioned Khan Academy earlier. I hadn't even thought about watching Khan Academy videos for college. They get kind of long, right? Some of those get kind of long. There's a lot there, but um, it's, it's a great source, honestly. So anyway, um, one, and, and I'm sure I've mentioned this before, one great thing that's come out of this pandemic is uh, a lot of educators, just like I am right now, it, it wasn't any, I didn't hesitate to just say, you know what, I'll just record what you might. A couple people can't be here. It's no problem. I'll just record lecture. I'll post on YouTube. And that way, anybody else can find it too. Right? Um, and you guys, if you haven't looked, you'll find that for probably some of your other classes too. Not just this class, but other classes. People will post. We're <laughs> putting this effort into making these videos, whether they're good or not. We'll post. Okay, a couple of terms. I've just gone on a tangent. Here we go. A couple of terms here. Oncogenes, these are genes that cause a cell to become cancerous. Genes that could potentially cause a cell to be cancerous is a proto-oncogene, right? So if it's proto-oncogene, that means that it is, um, it's normal, it's functioning okay, the, the, tumors being, the tumors are being suppressed, cells are dividing correctly in a controlled fashion, but if a mutation occurs in just the wrong way, it can damage the cell's ability to reproduce effectively and correctly. And that's, that is a, a potential side effect, of course, of that is cancer. All right. Um, and so just kind of quickly here, the, uh, there's not a whole lot to talk about for the cell pro cycle of prokaryotes, just simply that um, one thing we haven't talked about is, is I, I know the text has talked about it, I haven't talked about it in here. Bacteria have just typically a single chromosome, whereas with prokaryotic cells, animal cells, plant, fungi cells, we have these, these X structures that I've just drawn for you of two chromatids bound together to form a chromosome, and you've got a whole bunch of pairs of those chromosomes. Most bacteria don't necessarily have that. They just have a ring of DNA 
bound up in this nuclear envelope. It's not technically a nucleus. It doesn't have the same membrane structure ours do. They have this, this circular set of DNA that um, it does partition off from the rest of the cell. And it just needs to make a copy of that. So that's, that's not, it's a lot simpler. Um, and then I think your text mentions we're, we're not, science is not 100% sure how those two copies of the ring, now you've got two copies of this ring of DNA. We're not entirely sure how, but somehow it moves to opposite ends of the cell. We've got a pretty good idea. We've, we've got a pretty good understanding, or much more developed understanding, of this mitotic spindle we see, excuse me, in uh, eukaryotic cells because we can actually see it with light microscopes. We're not we're not entirely sure how prokaryotes do it for sure. We just know that it does occur. You know, two copies now of that one chromosome moves its opposite ends of the cell, and similar to what we had with. Um, what you have with your, your cytokinesis and animal cells, you got some sort of protein ring. And that protein ring then contracts and eventually it contracts enough that the, 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 the cell membranes uh, will pinch off and fuse together in two separate pieces. Set very similar to what we see in animal cells. Um, the protein is different here. It's, you can see it's the filamenting temperature sensitive mutant C protein, the FTSC is the reverse sign. Uh, but it works similar to the actin ring that we see in animal cells. It creates a cleavage furrow separate into two cells. Okay. All right. That finishes chapter 10. Okay. Finishes chapter 10. That's, that's a good amount. I'll mention just a couple of things about chapter 11. I don't have PowerPoint prepared, but I don't mind using just five or six minutes. We won't go the whole time. If you give me just five or six minutes here. <clears throat> So chapter 11, questions about chapter 10, before we get going. Okay. Chapter 11 is going to refer to meiosis, right? Meiosis is the generation of haploid cells for sexual reproduction as opposed to mitosis which is the generation of what we call diploid cells for growth and maintenance. Very similar, very, very, very similar mechanisms in both processes. Results slightly different. Again, what is a haploid? Well, in humans, I think we talked briefly about this when we talked about yeast cells, um, but in humans, each cell has 46 chromosomes. Okay, 46 chromosomes. That is 23 from each parent, 23 pairs. Right. 
have 23 pairs of chromosomes. We call these homologous chromosomes. They're, they contain the information for the same genes. Okay. Like I mentioned last time, to the best of my knowledge, I need to go get tested, but to the best of my knowledge, I'm type O blood, which means if that's the case, if that's true, that means from, because and we're going to talk about genetics a little bit later, because O is recessive, that means from both my father and my mother, on the homologous, homologous chromosomes that code for blood type, both of them had information to code for type O. So both of them gave me type O. So for all genes, you have two chromosomes that describe how that gene is going to be expressed in an individual, uh, one from each parent. <clears throat> And that allows for diversity a little bit to come from each parent there. Now, your diploid cells have 46 of these chromosomes. One from each parent. Your haploid cells have 23 chromosomes. These are, in most organisms, we refer to these as sperm and egg cells. Sperm cells only have 23 chromosomes. Egg cells only have 23 chromosomes. When a sperm combines and fuses with an egg cell, that new cell, that new offspring cell, now has 46 chromosomes, which can now grow into a fully functioning human being, hopefully. Again, chapter 11, our focus is going to be on meiosis. Process through how is it different, what is different, how is it different that we produce these haploid cells where we only have half of chromosome, so it can combine with another haploid cell to produce an offspring. A lot of similarity, slight differences, and that's plenty. I'm going to call that a night. You guys okay with that? We're at an hour? All right. We kind of hit a point in the semester. It's like, I don't feel like we have to rush, but let's keep moving. All right, guys. Um, let's start here on Wednesday, and then we'll We'll do lab after this, back out the STEM building like we did last time. Okay? Look at the chapter six, or I'm sorry, the, the lab six and seven, just like you did last time. Look at those before you come. That way uh, it makes sense. We can go kind of quickly through it, and I'll walk with you, and we'll make it work. See you guys next time. Have a good rest of your week. Again, chapter nine is homework is up. Nine, ten quiz is up. I will put a ten homework up between now and next class period. Okay? Don't fall behind. <clears throat>